Mike Melinda, editor in chief of Guitar Player Magazine, and I'm on Musicians on the Record. <laughs> Bring it on! Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. This is the show where we're getting the musician's story, and this is going to be another fun one today. We're talking all about guitar with guitarist and editor-in-chief of Guitar Player Magazine, Mike Melenda is on the show. Welcome, Mike. Hey, David. Hello, everybody out there. It's kind of weird to be in front of the camera for a change. Right, right. Well, this is what's so exciting because kind of like me, Mike, and you've been doing this way longer, you tell other people's stories about the guitar and, and everything about guitar. So I'm really excited. We're going to get to hear more of your story today. Um, but can we also start with how the heck did Guitar Player uh, Magazine and online get to be 50 years old? How did that happen? Well, I guess uh, Bud Eastman, you know, our, found, our late founder, I, I, he must have done it right back in 1967 when he figured this thing out. I mean, uh, I, I'm proud for, for him and the editors who were working with him back then and, and into the 70s and 80s, of course, and through all the 50 years, actually, that, um, you, you know, Bud invented this gear magazine thing. I mean, Guitar World and Premier Guitar and... Uh, any guitar magazine in France or Poland or Russia, you know, right. it, uh, owes a debt of gratitude to Bud for actually founding the, um, you know, the whole this, this category of, of guitar slash guitar slash guitar gear magazines. Yes. And, um, you know, it's just a credit to the staff for the last 50 years that they have uh, really, you know, lived and loved and been obsessed by all this stuff and have been able to bring you know, great interviews and great gear reviews and great guitar lessons to uh, to the to the community. It's it's really uh, you know it's kind of humbling to sit there, you sit here and look at this fifty year old magazine and go, yeah, you know, how is it so alive? It's, it's crazy. Yeah, and and how cool is that that you get to be the steward of that today as the editor in chief and you know guide where it's going into the future. Yeah, it's a uh, it's kind of a. Uh, it, it, it makes me paranoid all the time <laughs> that I'm doing the, the right thing. Yeah. And I've been here 20 years now, but, uh, you know, obviously Don Men, who was editor, and Tom Wheeler, of course, who's probably the, the most famous guitar player editor. Um, you know, everybody, uh, you know, Joe Gore, Dominic Milano, um, Richard Johnston, and anybody who's had the seat has done an awesome job at, at keeping things together. Because they were hippies, of course, it was kind of an interesting. Uh, it was a it was a phalanx of guitars, acoustic selectors with little hats on top. Oh, great! I love it. That's fantastic. And a matter of fact, in uh, the four issues that they put out in 1967, there was not an actual guitar player or a famous guitar player on the cover. Right. Sure. They were just starting out and cutting their teeth right. with all of that, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's talk about your story and obviously how all of that happened of you getting to this place. When did you first fall in love with guitar? When did music start for you? Well, it, it, like many people of my generation, it goes back to the Beatles sitting in front of the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964 and getting, getting my mind blown by that, having my dad calling them girls and just making snotty sides throughout the whole performance. Right. <laughs> I, think he was, I think he was kind of pissed off that Dean Martin was an honor or something. Right. So <laughs> I, I kind of realized, uh, okay, if my dad's not digging this, this has got to be what I need. And plus, I was just transfixed. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that. And then, right. and then later on, uh, what really kicked it in for me, um, I saw, I think, The Who on the Today Show, uh, filmed in London. Wow. And... Um, 
you know, I'd always had weird self-image issues and all that. And there's Peter Townsend who's kind of tall and yeah. gawky and a nose bigger than mine. I didn't think he could get a nose bigger than mine. And I went, well, if he's got all these girls screaming at him, then right. this is what I need. This is what I need to do. There we go. Uh, right. And of course, like most uh, musicians, uh, if they did start out for that lust for the opposite sex, uh, it did transform itself into a love for the guitar, the instrument, the music, and um, I mean, I, I'm forever thankful that whatever was in my DNA just kind of, uh, well, I, I don't think it was in my DNA, because I come from Italian working class, so I think okay. everything in my DNA was fighting me to say, you cannot be a musician, right, but, right. but whatever, whatever little hiccup happened that allowed me to embrace this instrument, I'm forever thankful it's just uh you know it's made my life an awesome an, yeah. an awesome life yeah and so the beatles and the who were some of those early influences i love those bands as well they're incredible uh what what drove you towards the guitar and to pick that up do you remember your first guitar as well uh it was well it it was a horror acoustic um you know i went to my mom and said i want to do this uh we got a horrible, I think my grandmother probably brought me a horrible coup from Sears or something like that. It was always good, better, best, and I think I got the not so good. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, my mom immediately signed me up for lessons with like a 97 year old Swedish woman who was not even close to what I wanted to learn. So I, I gave it up for a, a while. And then um, I think I kind of came back to it a, a little late, like probably high school. Because then, you know, buddies were forming bands and things like that. It became like a social, a social thing. Yeah. And all self-taught, Mike? Or were there some important teachers? Maybe not the, the lovely 97-year-old woman, but uh, were there some important teachers that came along? There was a jazz teacher. There was a guitar shop in my neighborhood on 7th Avenue in Irving, San Francisco. Like It was called Gene's Guitar Shop. And that's kind of where... I would hang out there all the time trying to absorb it. Yeah. One of these guys kind of noticed me all the time, said, what are you doing? Well, I kind of want to, I kind of want to play guitar. He says, well, do you know how to play guitar? Well, yeah, I looked at some books, and he said, well, you, you need me to, you need to hire me to teach it so you know what you're doing. And uh, I was into all the British bands, and he was a jazz teacher, and he uh, also was into, like, the Allman Brothers and, you know, bands I wasn't really that into, but it did expand my knowledge of the guitar. He also taught me blues. But what he didn't teach me, and this is something that weirded me out for a long time, was he didn't teach me the pentatonic scale. Okay. Uh, he taught me a lot of modes, you know, Aeolian, you know, all that stuff, uh, Phrygian, etc. And um, that's kind of how I learned how to, how to derive solos from, from those modes rather than the pentatonic scale. So whenever I would jam with people, it would always be, I'd always be a little bit weirder. And I don't know if it's good weird or bad weird, but um, it, it, was in, it was interesting. And it kind of took me a while to figure out how to make that work. And the, the, the savior for me was when I heard uh, um, Frampton Comes Alive in a record store. Mm. And all of a sudden I'm going, oh man, that, those solos kind of sound like the note, the note choices that I'm making, although anyway, I'm not anywhere near yeah. even infinitesimally as good as Peter, as Peter Frampton, but but I kind of heard a uh, you know a brother in arms so to speak. It's yes. like I, I don't feel so weird anymore. Right. And uh, I realized later on after talking to him that of course you know he approached the guitar. Of course, he obviously knows the uh, yeah. you know, the pentatonic, but he uses a lot of modes in his playing. And it was like ah, finally, I don't feel like you know he's a crap. Right. Yeah. Somebody speaking your language. Right. That's very great. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So the pentatonic for, you know, and I like to try to bring this around to someone who's picking up their first guitar or just learning the guitar as well. That's an important aspect to learn the pentatonic scale. Yeah, I think if you're going to jam it. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, the, it's the language of rock guitar for sure. Or the, or the foundational language of rock guitar. From there, if you want to get more interesting and, uh, try to forge your own style, which of course all guitars struggle and strive to do. Uh, studying arpeggios and, uh, and modes and you know, even listening to saxophone players and 
you know, Mack trucks and all that, anything you can derive the sound from would, would be good. But okay. yeah. starting out with that five note scale is always a good place to start. Got it. Yeah. Nice. So you started taking lessons. Your passion for guitar and music is growing. In your mind, Mike, what's the dream that's brewing of what you want to do with music? Well, obviously, I think I'm going to be a rock star, of yeah, course. Sure. You know, Who does it? Right? <laughs> hey, you know, right. uh, I'm on the way. This yeah. is the beginning. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I didn't realize then how, uh, you know, wonderful and brutal and brutally wonderful <laughs> right. it is to be in the music business. Uh, yeah. That was, uh, I mean, I just thought, you know, I read voraciously, of course, and I just thought, well, I'm going to be playing in a club somewhere and someone's going to discover me and uh, I'm going to have a record deal and boom, that's, that's how it works. Right. Funny thing was everybody I talked to who was also a musician thought that was going to happen to them as well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, and, and the, the amazing thing is that it may be more rare, but sometimes it actually does happen, right? But Well, and that, that, that's exactly right. That's always the thing that when you try to, you know, if I'm giving seminars to today about, you know, prepping yourself for being, uh, a self-contained, self-sustaining musician in, in, you know, in the 21st century, um, you know, there are enough, you know, weird fantasy tales where uh, a young person can go, well, you know, I, I know someone's just going to pick me up off the street and say I'm a star. I mean, right. because that does happen. You're right. It right. still happens today. Yeah. But it doesn't happen to most of us, so that's right. sometimes you've got to put the hard work in. That's right. In, well, in the case, yeah. Exactly. Well, and that's always the case, too, that it's hard work even with some luck. Can I, can I ask for you, Mike, what have been some of the obstacles and challenges? Because you, it may not have been the original dream, but you're making a living with music in the music business, right? So what are some of those obstacles and challenges you've had to overcome? Well, you never know where your talent really, really is. And I think that, especially today with uh, the web and YouTube and everything, if you produce something that's original, people will be drawn to it and, uh, and you'll have an audience. I think back in the, the 70s, it was more controlled by the record companies. But, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm this, it was this undiscovered rock star that had awesome songs and awesome voice and awesome guitar licks and they just didn't, didn't dig me because there's obviously a lot of reasons why somebody is successful or is not successful sure. in the entertainment business. But, um, but my challenge was just, uh, I, you know, I had acne and acne scars and I mean, they would just say outright, well, would you consider getting a dermabrasion? I mean, they weren't offering me a, like, if, hey, if you get a dermabrasion, we'll give you a record contract. But I constantly heard that, you know, my looks were not up to snuff for whatever they wanted to do. So um, it took me a while. Uh, and I had a manager later on who got a couple of my songs or, or the band I was in song into a flexi disc that was reduced and released in, in Germany. And from there, it was the Germans really that uh, kind of drove my career at that point. You know, they wanted to hear more things. They wanted to see me perform. They didn't care that I had acne scars. They just liked the fact that I jumped up and down a lot. Right, so. right, right, exactly. Again, going back to the Pete Townsend thing, or my God, if if uh, physical looks were a requirement for rock and roll, I mean, three quarters of folks <laughs> wouldn't be in it. Ramones, whoever, yeah. right? I mean, my God. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you got to be interesting, but you know, I mean, I was kind of coming up in, in the pretty boy era, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there was that, and, and like I said, I probably did, I was probably awful. They were just trying to be okay. not not. They tried to let me down in a not easy, not nice manner by just saying I look like crap. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Yeah. But, but, but the point though is like, you know, today sometimes uh, it's difficult for a, an older person to look sometimes at the bands that are really making it because like the, the people before me in my era, you know, we were deluged by. Uh, you know, Dean Martin, uh, Frank Sinatra, right. Sammy Davis, yes. uh, you know, uh, well, Chuck Berry, um, right. you know, and, and these people that were just devastatingly charismatic performers. So when you decided that, okay, I'm all in now, I, I want to try to, I want to try to be that kind of person. I want to be an entertainer. Right. 
you know, that, that stuff was just zip locked into your brain. It's like you didn't get out there and look at your shoes. You, know, you didn't get out there and yeah. look down, uh, you know, at your set list or or not move around. It's like you were you were shown yeah. by explicitly what a awesome entertainer did to um, seduce an audience. Sure. Right. So that's what we were all up against. Like, well, how can I be, you know. You know, what can I what can I do to be uh, John Lennon, or right. what can I do to be Jimmy Page? You know, you had to. Right. You know, you you kind of knew. Well, right, and those guys, you know, that's the top of the the cream of the crop of musicianship, right? And and what we were all emulating to to get to. Yeah. Well, and even seeing James Brown, you know, he just went. Yeah. Oh, oh boy! Right. You know, <laughs> it, it's a tsunami of charisma. Absolutely. <laughs> like, right. Amazing. You know, how do I get there, you know, in a rock context or, or what can I, yeah. what can I borrow, you know, what can I synthesize, what can I throw together in a little stew and come up with something that's my own? I mean, sure. we, we, you know, my peers and I talked about this a lot, you know, how do we, how do we come up with a, an identity that's, um, you know, a, a public identity? You bet. You, a brand, right? A brand and a sound. Tell us a well, little... We didn't call it that back then, but that's exactly right. Sure, right. <laughs> Yeah, different different word back then, right? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because obviously, you know, you went for your dream. Um, sometimes we're on the second, third, or fourth iteration of the dream, but you went for it. Where did that take you? Obviously, you, you made an album or maybe more, went on tour, also with a band as well? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I was lucky enough to be uh, around San Francisco during the punk explosion, which was also another, you know, little uh, grenade in my brain. Uh, wow, this is exciting music. It's not, it's not necessarily virtuosic music, but it's a lot of fun. Yes. We had the Mabu High Gardens, a famous punk club on Broadway in San Francisco. There was a community uh, developing around it. And, and that's something that I love too, because uh, just a you know, sidebar, when I became in love with uh, the theater or with ballet or with uh, films and things like that, um, I would always go back to the 30s, like in Paris where they have the salons, you have uh, Jean Pacteau and Pablo Picasso and all these people just kind of, in, you know, hybrid, they're the hybrids of art where they would like, you know, work on ballets together or work on films together. And that sense of community, that artistic community really, really appealed to me. Yes. I wasn't kind of getting that so much from the early 70s rockers, but once the punk thing hit, mm -hmm. even though it, it definitely had some societal problems, uh, yeah. but it was like an us against them situation, which I was attracted to. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just uh, razor blades and, and safety pins. There was a punk art, punk literature, punk film, punk uh, theater. Yeah. And um, and it was basically just, we just want to do what we want to do. Right. I mean, you know, people always think the punks are the sex pistols or whatever. Well, but there were reggae bands that were punk and there were prog bands that were punk, you know. Right. It's, it was just a matter of accepting uh, a view of the world that was more, you know, internal. Does that make sense? You it know, does. we're, we're going to, you know, forget the business. We're going to do what right. we like. And I, and I was so attracted to that that community. So, so that kind of started off, uh, you know, my kind of resonating around that that community. Um, then I decided to kind of get off my butt and do something bigger. That, that sounds arrogant, but I just wanted to challenge myself. So I did a, a basically was one of San Francisco's first rock um, uh, rock theater, multimedia theater pieces called Street Beat, which Bill Graham and Queenie Taylor kind of took under their wing at Wolf Gangs, which was a, a Bill Graham's club here in San Francisco. They uh, basically let us headline. It, it was sold out. Uh, it was crazy. It involved dancers, film projections, uh, found sounds, a band on stage actually playing the music acting things out. And that was kind of the big thing for me. I had a lot of people coming after me then. And uh, what that culminated into signing some of the worst uh, contracts anyone could ever sign. <laughs> so. Can we talk about that too, Mike? Because I think that's such an important lesson 
you know, it's unfortunate you and many others had to go through that. But, you know, one of our recent interviews with Paul Quinn, who was an entertainment lawyer and talks all about, he went through it himself of signing a really bad contract so that, you know, there are lessons learned with all of that and might save somebody else in the future from doing that. If you, if we could turn the clock back, what would you have done differently with that? Well, it's, it's hard for me to remember back then. And, and, um, you know, definitely my ego, like most performers, was involved somewhat. Sure. But I wasn't, I wasn't a performer who just wanted to be a rock star at that point because I knew that once you'll do anything to be a rock star, the business people can just tear mm -hmm. you apart, you know. Yeah. I really did want to try to watch out for myself, but unfortunately, everything happens so fast and so big and you're taking meetings and right. and uh you know, we're offering you this we're offering you that you know have a lawyer check this and right. and i mean i did have a lawyer check one of the contracts and she did uh say this isn't good and i kind of went well you know maybe i should just roll the dice because they're offering sure. a lot sure. sadly we didn't come through with so uh I was just stupid, you know, and I think that when you talk to anybody today, or I, don't, I don't know what, what Paul said, you just have to really be as dispassionate as possible for both your own ego and your work. You know, you have to look at it like I invented milk or something, you know, and I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let this, anyone else steal this from me. I'm not going to let this be uh, marginalized. I'm not going to let this be well, stolen or, or, or uh, exploited in a way I'm not happy with. Yeah. You just have to sit there and go and have the strength to say no, 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 no. And it might blow up in your face. Saying no is sometimes a bad thing. Maybe sometimes you don't get where you want to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, and every situation is different. So sure. I'm sure Paul probably said that. So it's hard to kind of know, yeah. you know, should I say yes and take a chance? Because sometimes that can work out for you. Right. Or should I say no because I know this is a bad deal and I need to run away from this as far away as I can get? It's a tough one. Yeah. But I think being willing to at least, uh, I, I love what you're saying, explore the no and, and sit with that and not just go for that first thing if they're offering you the moon. Yeah, absolutely. It, it does take a lot of strength. And, of course, when you get to the point where you have something that's saleable, when you have something that looks like it's commercial and the people who want to make money are sniffing around you, you're going to get a whole bunch of opinions and counsel. And it can be absolutely mind-numbing to try to work through all of the comments and figure out a way to, uh, you know, what do I do? You know, what's the right thing to do? It, it, it's it's difficult for anybody, and it's per certainly difficult if you're like 17 or, you know, I mean, now, you know, the rock stars now are like teenagers. It's, right. it's like, how do you figure that stuff out yeah. when you're so young? That's right. No question. Yeah. And if you don't have a supportive uh, group of people or family around you, that can be even worse, as we've seen with some of the folks, right? So tell me a little bit about some other influences, whether musically, guitar-wise, or other musicians. You, you mentioned jazz uh, guitar in your uh, your training. Who are those musicians that you've sort of just got at the, the top of the heap for you? Well, not so much jazz. Um, you know, it's funny, when I read Guitar Player magazine back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, once again, having this kind of theatrical brain, I would read like the Howard Roberts columns and Jimmy Stewart columns, and they're talking about, uh, you know, modes and how to deal with harmony, and it sounded so intellectual, and I was really drawn to that. But when I actually bought some records, you know, and this is a guy, I'm not, it's going to sound like I'm putting this down, but I'm not, but you know, here's a guy who came up with the Who and the Beatles and, uh, you know, David Bowie and all that kind of stuff, so, and, I, and I'm listening to this, you know, do do boop do boo do ba do 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 you know, it was kind of like I went... Oh, I'm not going to play this. <laughs> you know, there's no way. Um, but uh, so it took me a long time to kind of come back to that and realize the genius and a lot of that that stuff. But uh, you know, I mean, Mick Ronson's a big one for me. Yes. Paul Kossoff of Free right. is a big one for me. Um, 
you know, you get to some of the modern guys. Now, I, I kind of go for like the just absolutely ferocious players that as trained as they might be, they just sound like they're, you know, these savage beasts. And like, you know, Reeves, Reeves Gabrels is an, is an amazing player. Uh, I just talked to um, Adrian Ballou a couple of minutes ago about his new record. And, um, you know, he's just insanely creative. I don't, I don't even know where how he comes up with the things he comes up with. So I like to be surprised and, and I like to have somebody grab me by the throat. So those kind of players are the ones that, you know, really kind of float my boat. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, I mean, you're going on your journey with music, with guitar. Let's talk about the, the origins with you and Guitar Player Magazine. How did that even come about for you? Well, it was kind of a roundabout thing. Um, I had come back from my music career and I had a degree in journalism and my wife at the time, you know, I started a, a, a studio, a recording studio with, with a high school buddy of mine. And, um, but I, I would kind of wasn't digging engineering bands. Um, and, and she kind of said, well, what are you moping around? I, I got the paper out. I just found this magazine, Electronic Musician in, in Emeryville, that's looking for an assistant editor. You've got a journalism degree. Get out of the house. Do something. So I, I went for an interview there, and it was a complete snot because I just figured, hey, I'm a real musician. These guys are just whatever I thought. I mean, I was being a real jerk. And, and of course, when you don't want something sometimes, you end up getting it. So... I actually had one of the senior editors visit me at my studio and say, you know, you're, you're kind of being standoffish about this, but we really want someone who's, who's lived the life, who, who, who knows music technology, who knows his way around the studio, and you're kind of being a dick. Can you just call the editor-in-chief and go, yeah, you're interested in the job? So... That did a couple of things. First of all, it, it put in my face that I was being a dick. <laughs> and second, second off, it said, you know, well, I should probably explore this because I, I am trained as a writer, so maybe this is something I shouldn't ignore. So I said, okay, and they gave me the job. Uh, a year later, I was editor-in-chief, so that was nice. Yeah. Um, I had an unbelievable stroke of luck in that the magazine, Electronic Musician, had been kind of like a DIY mm -hmm. computer magazine, really nerdy. But when I got in, the home studio thing was just starting to explode. Mm -hmm. And that was my interest because I had been working in studios for so long as a professional musician where I had got my hand slapped for touching a knob or had gotten the evil look when I asked, well, why, what's that microphone? Or sure. why, are you, why are you placing the microphones there? And, uh, you know, please just make the music let us do our job. Right. So I thought, hey, home studios, this is awesome. Nobody can tell you what to do. That's right. You can do exactly what you want. So I embraced that, uh, turned the magazine into more or less of a home recording magazine, which of course also involved computers, of course. Sure. And um, it uh, and the market exploded because all these companies, you know, Alesis with their ADAT, Sony, uh, uh, you know, just a, no a number of companies. Everybody was making recording gear, cheaper microphones, uh, cheaper preamps. So I, once again, stroke of luck. It's like the magazine exploded, became extremely successful. And, um, you know, because I was the editor, I got a lot of credit for that, even though it was an awesome staff and it was definitely a collaborative effort to make that happen. But I was glad once again that um, you know my desire to be a musician my training my curiosity about engineering and production kind of worked out to where I was in the right place at the right at the right time amazing amazing yeah I mean it was it was just crazy but um, so if you, if you fast forward to I think it was 1996 or something um, guitar player was going through a, a business lull. And the, uh, the publisher there, the two publishers, Ed Senstack and Ross Garnick, contacted me and said, would you be interested in moving over to Guitar Player? And of course I'm going, well, heck yeah. I mean, I, I, I had that magazine in my guitar case when I was a little kid, you know, how exciting is this? Sure. And um, 
But uh, a number of things, so I had a meeting with the staff, which was kind of scary. They were all around the conference room table, just grilling the heck out of me. And um, What were some of those and, questions they were asking you, Mike? Well, I mean, I don't think they were digging the fact that I was from this, what they still consider to be a nerdy uh, home recording magazine. So do you know anything about guitar? Do you play guitar? Who are your favorite guitar players? What kind of articles would you have us write? Right. And um, it was like, wow, okay. Um, and then I went home and, uh, you know, my, my wife at the time told me, yeah, I kind of want to get divorced. Mm. So it was like, uh Oh, yeah. so it just, it just seemed like having a new job and figuring out what I was going to do, getting out of a marriage was not the time to get the new job. Sure. So I, I turned them down. Uh, they put Richard Johnson, who was uh, the editor of bass player in charge of guitar player, who was, you know, an awesome editor. Yeah. Awesome, awesome writer, yeah. and uh, a year later they came back, and Ed and Ross came back and said, um, you know, would you reconsider? You know, we really want to move Richard over to Bass Player Magazine and put you in charge of guitar player. And at that point I said, timing's right, let's do it. Okay. And, uh, and there you go, 1997 I was in the seat. Amazing. Amazing. Can you give us uh, a glimpse of a little bit of, just a, maybe briefly, a day in the life of what editing Guitar Player Magazine and online is? what What's a typical day like for you? Well, of course, it, it's changed. I mean, it's so funny to think about 1997, 98, uh, where it was pretty much all the magazine all the time. So you had three weeks to four weeks to get an issue plan. Yeah. Um, you had a bunch of editors, uh, copy editors, and... Uh, to art directors, you know, per magazine back then. And, uh, you know, you walk into people's offices and they might be writing songs or asleep, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, because there was time to, to let everything kind of gestate. Yeah. And um, obviously today, <clears throat> with the web yeah. and uh, Twitter, Facebook, sure. Instagram, you know, we have like almost hourly deadlines. You're constantly looking for, for stories, constantly looking to either curate things to put online or to write original stories that are going to resonate with the audience. Right. And you throw that on top of the magazine, which still has a, a three-week gestation period from, uh, you know, deciding what we're going to do to putting it out. Sure. But it, that's, that's a lot of work. That's and a lot of work. Because, yeah, because of the way the publishing industry has gone, which has been shrinking, we have less editors to, to do that work. So... It's quite a, I mean, I, I give credit to everybody on the staff, from the production people to the freelancers to the art directors to the editors. It, it's a lot of work. Sure. It's, a yeah. lot, it's a ton of pressure. Yeah. And we have to still maintain the same level of quality no matter, no matter what we do. Yeah. So, and uh, it's, it's all online. People can go check it out, guitarplayer.com. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what are we talking about? Maybe 90, 95% of the staff are guitar players themselves, or has that changed over time as well? Well, as far as the, uh, the editors go, and the, it, it's 100%. 100%. It's always been 100%. Okay. Now, you didn't get a job as a guitar player if you weren't a player yourself. Right. Right. Now, if you were an assistant art director or a production person that schedules, you know, the print run and things like that. Well, of course, you're probably, you're somebody who probably likes music, but not necessarily a, a player. Yeah. Sure. What are some of the highlights so far? Because I'm sure there are more to come, Mike, but just being the editor in chief working at Guitar Player Magazine, I imagine, like you just said, you spoke with Adrian Blue on the phone. Who have you gotten to meet? Who do you wish you could meet? Well, it's, it's been, I mean, you know, I mean, how can you, it, it's so, it's so crazy to even visualize that, that pretty much every hero I've ever had in my whole life, I've been able to talk to or meet as the editor of guitar player. Uh, haven't met Jimmy Page, um, but pretty much everyone else except for John Lennon and, uh, George Harrison, um, Pretty much, pretty much everyone else you can name, I've, I've, I've had some kind of a, either written about them or interviewed them in person or on the phone or, or, or had a, a, you know, a, a relationship with them. It's yeah. been 
It's been crazy. Yeah. It's been. It's, uh, I mean, and, and it's all about it's all about the job. But but I, I still realize too that it's all about the job. You know, it's not. I've made some good friends, but I've also made those good friends because I'm the editor and guitar player. So I always sure. make sure that that's always top of my mind in any interactions. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Right. Let's talk about a guitar, a beginning guitar player, someone who's just finding out about Guitar Player Magazine and wants to learn, what are the top two or three things that you would say to them of, of where to go on their guitar journey? Well, I think that today you have to realize that the guitar is not just a virtuosic incident, you know, an instrument. You don't have to look at Al Di Miola or uh, any of the, you know, or Brad Paisley or something and go, oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to play like that, so I just forget about it. I mean, the guitar, if you're someone who wants to communicate through music, whether it's songwriting or instrumental music or, or, or whatever, um, you have to realize that the guitar is an awesome starting point, e even if you just make noise with it. And you shouldn't be afraid of it at all. You can buy some pedals and create some amazing stuff for EDM music or or, or whatever, you know, you can do soundtracks. You, know, you don't have to sit there and spend five years studying every mode and, and you know, voraciously practicing your, your chops. I mean, it's good if you do. I, I think you'll, you'll be, uh, you know, emboldened and get confidence and, and grow as a person if you do take that journey, but you don't have to. You can just be someone who, who makes noise with the strings or is creative, you know, uh, I mean, sometimes it's we forget that someone who can come up with some great, with a great chord progression it is an awesome guitarist, as much as someone who can come up with an awesome guitar solo. You bet. So exactly. It's, it, so I mean, I guess the main thing trying to get younger people to uh, gravitate to the guitar is just not to be scared of it. It, it. It's there to to be used any way you want to use it. You don't have to be a, a super technical wizard. You know, you can be a genius composer and use the guitar as, as a way to get there. That's right. No question about it. Yeah. Um, as well as, so that would be maybe for a beginner. What about someone who's looking to make it in the music business? Because there's been a lot of changes with that, Mike. What what advice would you give them? Well, it's it's hard. It's, it's hard to go, uh, I mean, even though it was brutally hard, in my early days, you depended on record companies, you depended on managers. But if you did get lucky and, and, and get the nod, uh, you could raise a family uh, on, the, on the revenue you were going to make. Right. Right. You know, today, it's hard to point to you know, what you're not making on streaming audio, what you're not making on CDs, not being sold you know, as, as much, what you're not making on YouTube advertising. I mean, if you get a million YouTube views, can you still can you raise a family on that on that revenue? So, I think today you have to really love the guitar and want to be, a, you know, a, a musician. And and whether you are also a fireman or an accountant or someone who works at uh, Target, you know. You, you have to, that love has got to carry you through because you might not be able to make an income, a, a good income and raise a family being, being a musician. You know, that said, um, you also have to, you know, I mean, it, it, in my day, we could just play the guitar and write songs. Somebody else took care of everything else. Today, you're the one who's taking care of everything else. You're, you're, you're the creator. You're the publicist. You're the marketing company. That's right. You're the record company. So I think to to your point of if you're an experienced player and do want to take a shot at making a, a living at this, it you got to realize that you can't just go. I don't want to bother with, with Facebook. I don't want to bother with Instagram. I don't want to bother with YouTube. Uh, you you really have to know how to exploit that stuff. Uh, one of my friends um, who's just put out a great record, uh, Ali Handel. A uh, female player who is just awesome. Um, she spent a year not finishing a record, but building up her um, social network right. to make sure that when her record was ready, because uh, it just dropped a, 
right, that drops next month, yeah. that she had the social network built up to be able to actually buy it once it came out, right. you know? Right. And I mean, that, that's not a conversation you and I would have, you know, in 1979 or 1985. That's right. That's <laughs> we wouldn't be saying, take a year off just to build your audience. Right. You know, that, that, that was unheard of. Right. Back then. Yeah. It's kind of, that would be madness back then, right? It, it would, it would be, yeah. You'd be crazy. It's right. like, well, you're telling me that you just don't want to do any work. That's what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. But that's reality today. You're right. You've got to build your audience. That's amazing. Yeah. So, can you name a couple of guitarists then that you see? Uh, who are doing really well at all of that, of, uh, you know, playing guitar, obviously, but building that audience, building that brand that others can look to, a t you know, a modern day guitarist that you think is doing well around that? Well, uh, we just did a, a cover story called Youthquake about young guitar players who are uh, actually doing that. And, um, and it's interesting because we have Marcus King, who... Uh, Warren Haynes is taken under his wing, and, and he's kind of developing a, an audience the old school way, uh, like like if it was 1978 or something. You know, he's touring, he's got a mentor in, in Warren, yeah. uh, and doing a lot of gigs to kind of build the audience. Okay. On the other hand, you've got people like Pliny or uh, uh, Jared James, who are uh, really good at putting stuff up on YouTube and, and building a, uh, a community by putting up awesome tracks on, on, on YouTube. Okay. Um, I interviewed a, like a nine-year-old Chinese guitar player who gets millions of views on, on YouTube. She's, she's amazing. Wow. Um, Incredible. And uh, so, well, of course, you know, the hard thing is, right, you know, you can sit there and you can search for cool guitar players on YouTube. Yeah. And you'll find people who have like 10 million views and things like that. But, you know, if, there, if I could write a book about how to go viral, you know, with right. your music, yeah. I'd be a gazillionaire. I, I wouldn't even, you know, you'd have to go through seven assistants to talk to me to schedule <laughs> this right. interview. <laughs> That's so, right. Exactly. Yeah. But I do know that um, more, it's, it's so important to, to, to be an individual to be true to yourself and to be as big as possible. You, know, you have to do something different. You have to do something that catches uh, people's ears and eyes. You don't have to be an actor and make yourself into something untrue, but you have to find that bit of your creativity that is extremely unique. And we all have it. You just have to be brave enough to you know, not necessarily sound exactly like the Jackson Five, or, or, or not exactly like Van Halen. You have to find what's important to you, or, or what's unique to you, and and hopefully that will resonate with other people who are looking for unique things to embrace. That's right. Yeah. Could we play a little bit of a word music word association? Um, I'll just name a couple of guitarists, and just off the top of your head, you tell me maybe your experience or what you love about them or whatever. But um, uh oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Are you okay with like that? Jeopardy. Uh oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> so let's start with Buddy Guy. Unbelievably powerful and charismatic. It shows me that you can be 80 plus years old and still rage like a demon. Extremely inspirational player. Right. Incredible, right? Um, Tommy Tedesco of The Wrecking Crew. Man, that guy could play anything funny as hell. He was a columnist for Guitar Player for a long time. Uh, we all we all miss him. Super evangelist for the guitar. Uh, great guy. Helped a lot of people uh, in their in their studio career. Yeah, awesome. You mentioned him a few minutes ago, Jimmy Page. Uh, not so much for guitar. I. I I adore his production. I mean, what he did with Led Zeppelin as far as the sonic imprint of that band was unbelievable. Yes. Unbelievable. I mean, it changed uh, in a certain way how we view what a huge rock record should sound like. You know, a, a genius behind the board. Yes. Yeah, talk about a guy who was multitasking, not only guitar, but the production, no question. And Hendrix. Well, you know, I mean... Uh, the, the, the wizard, really. Uh, I mean, brought, I guess, the quintessential rock star in a way. It's like char charisma, sexiness, 
danger, yes. uh, fashion, right. uh, being able to come up with songs, uh, with pop songs with awesome guitar in. I mean, we forget that that Jimmy was on AM radio. You know, and, uh, you know, with that kind of guitar playing, because once again, super important, he knew how to write an awesome song. Yes. You know, all that, all that technical guitar playing and all that tone that guitar players go for, it just, just sinks into the dust if you don't have an awesome song supporting it. That's right. Definitely a lot about the song, right? No question. Yeah. No question. And well, one more too, because I think I can't leave him out. There's there's so many that I'm leaving out, but Eric Clapton. Uh, extremely influential to me in Queen and Cream. Sorry, in Queen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was Eric in Cream or in he Queen? He might have been. No. He probably was yeah. in the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, extremely influential then. Um, uh, I wasn't really attracted to the blues, but even though he was. Playing blues rock, he kind of showed me that blues could be cool, which sounds like I'm being a jerk again. But, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I, I, I wanted to play rock, and, and sure, he sure. paved the way. Yeah. You know, later on, I think it got, you know, well, I mean, Derek and the Dominos, too. I mean, the pain he was going through, we all know the story about being in love with George Harrison's wife and all that. Sure. I mean, once again, when I mentioned earlier that I'm attracted to ferocious players, I mean, can, can you be more in pain and can you have more blood on the tracks than that record? Right, exactly. Uh, since then, you know, he's definitely being a polite player these days, which is less interesting to me. Sure, right. And then, so, for for a guitar player, obviously, and being the editor-in-chief of Guitar Player Magazine, how much do you still get to play, Mike? Because life gets busy and... You know, the work takes a lot of time. How much do you get to still play? Well, I, I play a lot. Uh, I, what, uh, I, my original music tends to go more for, you know, can I throw that out for other people to, to play or, you know, do I have some contact to get it as a soundtrack somewhere? But I started a, a few years ago this band called The Trouble with Monkeys, which kind of rocks out the hits of the monkeys, who, which I love, but I awesome. just figured, hey, if we put like really heavy guitar on that stuff, yeah. would it be fun? That's fantastic. Yeah, it was totally fun. I love it. Where um, where could people go see that? Either online or where do you guys you still play? Yeah, we have, I'm go, actually I'm going to. We got a little mini LA tour next next week. Uh, we play all the time, which is you know beneficial for me because I need to be out there and be part of the community. I can't just be this retired guy in an easy chair writing about guitar. Right, so right. the the trouble of monkeys allows me to not only get my yayas out because yep. I still feel twenty five years old when I step on that stage. But the other thing is I get to I get to test guitars, pedals, amplifiers, yes. you know, other accessories in a real world environment where I'm just beating the crap out of that stuff. That's right. You know, on, on stages. So it, everything feeds, feeds everything else. But, yeah, we, we play a lot. We have, there's a website, you know, thetroubledmonkeys.com, if anybody wants to take a look. Um, but it's been, it's been fun, and it's amazing how that music will resonate with young people who might not have seen the TV show. And right. obviously, if you're, you know, in my generation, that's all you did between 66 and 68 was every time the monkeys came on, you were glued in front of the TV show. You know, it's, uh, you know, we, there's, we have an audience of those people as well. It's been really fun. I was going to say, have you had a chance to meet Mike Nesmith and talk with him? I, I, I haven't met him. The other monkeys I have met, and they've been supportive. And also the record, when uh, the last record came out, uh, Rhino actually asked us, you know, through the monkeys asked, you know, or at least I, I don't know if it was Mickey or Peter or what, said, are you, are you going to punk up any of our new songs? So we actually did punk up their single, She Makes Me Laugh. So that's, that's something we're doing. Wonderful. That's fantastic. I should also say that in a weird confluence of bizarrity, getting back to what you're talking about, careers and all that, is yeah. uh, the Troubled Mon Monkeys actually got signed to MI5 Universal Really? Records, which is a huge deal. That's and awesome. They want us. Yeah, it's crazy. You yeah. know, out of nowhere, wow. and they want us to do um, 
half an album with monkeys covers, then half an album with originals kind of done in the style of how we do the monkeys. So I don't know how we can sell this. Kind of sounds like a weird concept, but I think it's great. That's wonderful. It's a beautiful guitar. Can you also tell us about the guitar, too, well, Mike? This is a this is actually a very um, low cost Gretsch Electromatic, and I always wanted like a, a monkeys yeah. model, but you know those guitars are like two or three thousand dollars now if you find an original one from the 60s yeah. but i did find a company that will make these uh monkeys pick guards wow. so i just found the red guitar with the monkey pick guard they also do this awesome thing if you can see that where that's you yes. know the uh yeah. the headstock there yeah so it's it's, it's a it's a faux monkeys guitar <laughs> And, you know, obviously being the editor-in-chief of Guitar Player Magazine, you also get a sneak peek of, you know, what's coming out as far as guitars, all of the cool gear. What that you might be able to tell us, because I'm sure there's stuff you can't yet, but what is kind of mind-blowing to you of what's coming out maybe uh, as far as, like, gear or guitar stuff that people can really get excited about? Well, if you're a guitar player, um, you know, there's constant innovations with, you know, on the digital side, you know, to be able to plug into a, a device, whether it's from Line 6 or Kemper or, uh, uh, you know, that you just, or, or, or Boss or any, any of these companies that, that make a digital a guitar tone producers, let's say, um, whether they're amps or or uh, pedal boards or things that you plug into a uh, garage band or whatever you want to record with. Yeah, those, those, those are getting better all, all the time. Um, there's been a, kind of a resurgence of, of well, I don't even know if it's a resurgence. Might, I mean, the boutique builder, uh, people who are building effects pedals in their garages that are turning into actual viable companies because they're making really cool and bizarre sounding stuff. Uh, I think Earthquaker devices started that way and they make like the weirdest pedals in, in the world, but they're awesome. Yeah. You know, once again, looking, looking for that way to be an individual. Um, I mean, there's just so many tools out there. It's, it's, and, and, and the web and interfacing with the web to share your music That's right. is a big deal. You know, there's, uh, whole bunch of things like Bandcamp or BandLab or, you know, ways that you can get your music out there. Yeah, so yes. it's funny, you know, there's the guitar now is a, a little bit of a lull in the, in the culture, but there's so many ways for guitarists and any, any musician to get their music out there into the, the world. It's like, I just kind of want to encourage everybody just to get it out there in the world. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I want to hear more guitar everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's great advice. And there's so many avenues for it. And one of them is with you, with Guitar Player Magazine. Would love to hear you play a little bit if you would be willing to play us out. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and being on Musicians on the Record. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.